So how important is it for your pH meter to be calibrated? Well, in this video, we're going to get into it. You're here with Mark Bowell and Dave Hansen on perfectgardens.com. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. And make sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram, and make sure to hit the notifications for future video release. Make sure to check out our monthly membership. For as little as $2.99 a month, you get access now to 105 members, 2,586 photos, 274 videos, 21 files, 1,106 shared links, and much, much more. So Dave, you created just a great presentation with this. Will you go ahead and share your screen and tell us about to, how important this is? What's up? What's up? This one for me, this one is extremely important, you know, and, and I've seen YouTube videos, I've seen forums, and I've seen people like saying, there's no need to pH your pen. It's just a gimmick for companies to keep selling you their solutions and the, the, the calibration solutions and keep getting money from you. And for me, this could be farther, farther from the truth. So we're going to dive into just some basic pointers and guidance to help you along with your growth. So why calibrate your pH pen? It's a big question. Well, one, we need to establish accurate readings of the water. If we're coming for help and people are asking you certain questions and you're giving them misinformation because your pen is not calibrated properly, it's really going to also affect the potential solution that any individual is going to give you. So that's why I state it will help potentially diagnose deficiencies caused by the water. Improper pH water can lead to specific nutrients not being available. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we're all pretty familiar with the chart showing the different nutrients, iron, nitrogen, calcium, and then they kind of give a range of at what pH do they get locked out or potentially less available. The pH balance of the water affects the acidity and or alkalinity content of your soil potentially. So if you're using certain medias like cocoa, pure peat moss, um, hydroponics, hydroponics, right. Hydroponics, it's going to potentially alter that substrate and where organics, a lot of people, depending on what amendments or inputs they have, they might have a little bit more of a buffer. So what the soil is doing underneath it, but for these other medias, it, it could have a direct impact really bad. And for me, most importantly, it's furthering your understanding of the relationship of the components of your water and how they affect your results, meaning how your plant is going to grow. And big as you point, get into veg, yeah. Big point to this real fast is just be be clear for everyone. Your microbiology are your chemists and your micro and your biologists, right? When you remove that and you grow with synthetic, it shuts all them down and you are the chemist and the biologist. And what you have to do is you mm -hmm. have to use these tools to measure this stuff. And if you don't, and things go off, it's, I mean, really just slight changes. And if I remember straight, every single time it drops down a 0.1, if I remember straight, it doesn't just drop down a 0.1, it actually drops down by the 10th power. So every single time, and I could be wrong, it's either dropping down by one full point or dropping down by every 0.1. I don't know everything. I have to double check this, but the significant thing about this is it's not just dropping by this little tiny bit. When it drops just a little bit, it gets exponentially stronger on the acidity or the alkalinity. And that's why unlocking these minerals and think about minerals are rocks, right? Or they're salts. These things have to dissolve and they have to become bioavailable in a certain size so that they get absorbed back into the plant. Yeah. And, and like you stated, with, with especially with the microbiology, you know, certain things can thrive in a more acidic um, solution. Things can th thrive more in alkaline. It's the same thing like in our oceans. You have thermals with, they never would think life could even be around them. And then they find these crabs and tubular animals that are living in extremely hot sulfuric waters. And if you're trying to balance that and you're on one end or the other, because you're not getting accurate readings, you either go to, you could potentially get bad or kill it all. So going back to what I stated where people are like, you don't need to calibrate it because it's just a way for companies to get money. So does it cost a lot of money to keep my pH pen calibrated? For this example, this is Blue Lab. This is what I personally use. And here is the cost breakdown. For this, you need a pH 7 and a pH 4 um, to proper calibrate it. So two points on the spectrum, one acidity and one alkaline. So here's the cost. And at the end of it, per test, just round it to $2, but it's a dollar and... 90 cents per test. Blue Labs wants you to 
calibrate minimal every 30 days. So if you take that, it's $22, call it $25 a year to properly calibrate your pen and have accurate results of your water and what you're putting into your plants. That's not a lot of money. And no. I mean, you, got, you think about how many spontaneous things we purchase and then we have buyer's regret, like <laughs> round it to $30 if you want, you know, like it's nothing. My father always told me that most people, when they're trying to cut the budget, they go to, to the, the closet <laughs> with the paper clips and they're like, you know, they're like, where can I start saving money? At the end right. of the day, just this one little thing, your pH. Okay. Yep. This one little thing. Think about how many other minerals it affects. And if you're using microbiology, think about how many workers this affects. It's like, it's like, imagine if we were all working outside and there was a thunderstorm, right? Versus a sunny day or a winter storm or whatever, like who's going to be inside versus outside on the sunny day versus the snowy day. Will people be outside in the snow? Absolutely. There's people out there that, that don't get cold. You know, that's, it's very interesting, but the majority of your workforce are going to be out there when that is not too hot. The, there's the right environment to exist in. And at the end of the day, all they're asking you to do, to do is just pay a dollar and 90 cents to, <laughs> to create the right environment for them to go work their ass off for you. So just flip your perspective around this. And, and I want to say too, this, this is based off of a, a 25 mLs. This is what I measured out what it took to, to properly cover the probe and have adequate amounts as like you see in the picture where they're putting it into the cup. So I measured it out. It's about 25 mils of, of each and yeah, 30 bucks. Um, general tips. So if you have a blue labs, look for that, that check mark, and then, you know, you're within 30 days, but start off with a quality pen. Blue labs are Apera. I hear too many times people like I've been through five, six, seven of the yellow Amazon ones, save your money, have a garage sale. It's really, really worth having a quality piece of equipment. Always follow the manufacturer's instructions. I'm, I'm big on that with anything. Um, they, their Blue Labs is very clear on their instructions on how to maintain your pH pen, how to calibrate it, when to calibrate it, the do's and the don'ts is very important. That way you're always ensuring your accuracy of your pen. Always keep the probe clean. This is a big one. Blue Labs does have a cleaner. And, and the reason that you have to keep that probe clean is that it's a very very specific type of glass that is made for these probes. And it, it has to deal with its ability to provide the conductivity needed to take that reading. So if you're using RO water, you might not have the buildup as you would obviously with like tap water or city water, where over time you might see the calcification, the crust, the whiteness of it. That stuff needs to be cleaned off properly to ensure those, those readings. Not all pens have the same features. Um, find one that suits your needs. Um, there's combo pens, you know, that show PPMs and also pH ranges. They also have different pH ranges as well. So Apera has a model that goes all the way up to like 12 or 14 for the alkalinity, but that means you're going to have three different points when you do your calibrations. And I think their kit does come with that. So you're going to be on the acidity end, probably around four. You're going to be then in the alkalinity, probably around seven, which is neutral or eight. And then they have another one up at 12. Um, so just know with your device, the calibrations might be a little bit different between the manufacturers. pH pens are precision tools and need to be handled with care. I'm big on that. Like treat it like you're working in a lab with a white coat and you're walking with this very expensive piece of equipment, treat it with care. You see YouTube videos, people throwing them in the bucket just because they're waterproof. <laughs> Don't throw them, just put them in the water very nicely and to ensure uh, the longevity uh, and the quality of the reading. Even though it's waterproof, probably still don't just throw the entire meter in there. There's cracks. You do drop it occasionally over time. Things expand, contract. You're in diff uh, constantly changing environments. Yeah. Whatever happens, like just Dave said, you know, do a good job. Just put it in there and stand there one thing at a time and wait and see what happens with your pH. Don't have 12 different things going in, in your life. Drop it in there and come back in 10 minutes, mixing your yeah. nutrients, doing all this stuff. Just this is why you have problems is you're doing too much all at once and it's creating issues. One yeah, thing a, at a time, a, slow it down. 
it's a very sensitive tool that glass probe and stuff is very sensitive and subject to not being able to take abuse. So, and I write it, this is the next line was if you drop your pen on the ground, you should recalibrate it to ensure accuracy. I think it was Canucks. Everyone's pretty familiar with Mr. Canucks. He had some plant issues and he's, and he's like, I dropped my pen the day before and I, t- I wanted to calibrate it. I forgot. And when he recalibrated, it, he was like three points off. And that's why his plants were starting to, to show what they were because his water was three points off. So if you drop it, stuff happens. Even if you have the check mark, just for a dollar and 90 cents, you can recalibrate it and be rest assured that you're going to have a, an accurate reading. And then the last thing is to make sure that the glass probe does not dry out. Use manufacturer solutions to submerge that glass probe. So for an example, Blue Labs has what they call a KCI solution. And then right in the bottom of their cap, they have a little reservoir with a sponge, drop a few drops in there. And when you close the cap, it's going to be fully submerged. So, you know, it's one of those things you, you really got to be thoughtful when you use this tool. You, you know, if you leave the cap open and leave it on the table for a few days, you know, I can't ensure that the, the, it's going to be accurate, even if you properly calibrate it and then rehydrate it. And they say, do not use water or OR water as well to keep it submerged. It's a very specific solution. When I was in the military, my upper sergeants would always tell me that your gear is what saves your life. Yeah. So if you if you have to cr- change your language around your tool and, and your equipment and the people around you, that if you do have a disconnection with these people or this stuff, so you don't care about it, change that la- language so that you create a healthier relationship or a, a relationship that, that you end up caring more about what you got going on on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. And then lastly, you guys can see that graph right here, just showing that, you know, the availability through the different ranges of the pH. And if you're, if you're recording your pHs and then you start seeing a deficiency of some sort and you resort back, maybe this chart will show you like, you know, um, I was at pH seven and oh shoot, iron starts to slim out around there, you know, so you can kind of formulate, you know, the cause and effect of what you put into your, into your plants. And that's the importance of calibrating your pH pen. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe only on Perfect Gardens TV. Have a great girl, everyone. This is a very big subject. A lot of things are being labeled as biostimulants. And so, like I said in part one, we're breaking this up into three parts. What are different carbon sources and how they are now labeling them as biostimulants? So first two, really, because they're fairly similar, right? Humic acid and fulvic acid. Why are they considering these to be biostimulants? 